I'm Sam Roberts of The New York Times, and welcome to The New York Times Close Up, Theater in Politics and the Theater in Politics, front and center today. In a moment, we'll talk with the renowned Shakespeare scholar Stephen Greenblatt, here to discuss his latest book, Tyrant, Shakespeare on Politics. William Shakespeare, a canny observer of the human condition, also very politically astute. Then we'll be joined by New York Times photographer Sarah Krulwich. She's been on the staff since 1979, covering the theater since 1994. She'll be one of three recipients of this year's Tony Awards Honors for Excellence. My Times colleagues discuss the week's lead stories on the backstory, and I'll have some additional thoughts on CODA. But first, the Pulitzer Prize and National Book Award-winning author Stephen Greenblatt. He's the John Cogan University Professor of the Humanities at Harvard. And his latest book, Tyrant, Shakespeare on Politics, just been published by W. W. Norton and Company. This is a book that you were thinking about writing before the 2016 presidential election. And as that election got closer, you realized it was almost a book you had to write. That's true, Sam. I, in some sense, I've been thinking about the book for decades because uh, Shakespeare was, as you say, an unusually canny observer of politics, but I didn't have the uh, strong impulse that I suddenly began to feel uh, in the months leading up to our election. And what happened that led you to write the book then? Well, there were a series of... Uh, Bad dreams, disruptions. Uh, some of them came true. Some of them came true for me, if not for everybody, of course. A, we, I respect the difference of opinion and, about these matters, but it was the daily dose of uh, shock and awe uh, of, the, uh, of the surprises that the rules that I had somehow assumed uh, were the rules that everyone had, that we would have forever. Uh, no longer were applying. You would be caught out in this, you'd be caught out in that, uh, and it didn't matter. And so I began to, th to feel disoriented uh, and um, confused a little bit about how to deal with the constant uh, news. Uh, and at that moment, I thought, let me go back 400 years and think uh, about the contemporary situation, but through somebody else's eyes, uh, through the eyes of the most brilliant playwright of the last 2,000 years, William Shakespeare. And what kind of parallels did you find? Well, there are many, many uh, parallels, not only to our own contemporary situation, but to uh, winds that are blowing around the world uh, in Hungary and in the Philippines and in Russia, uh, to the rise of uh, illiberal states uh, and to the rise of very strong autocratic uh, leaders who are indifferent to uh, the way the game was played uh, for a very long time. So Shakespeare was interested, deeply interested, in how does a whole country fall into the hands of a, uh, a disastrous leader. And all you need, of course, is 51 percent, or in this case, perhaps 49 percent to do that. Yes, it's, it doesn't... It, the interesting thing for, is that Shakespeare did think of it in terms of elections, which is very odd because he didn't live in an electoral democracy, he lived in a monarchy. But when he actually asked himself, how is it possible for someone like Richard III to come to power, a uh, truly catastrophic ruler, he thought he'd be elected. Uh, and when he tried to think his way out of that situation, how does a people get out of the nightmare, he also thought about elections in the last tragedy he wrote, Coriolanus. That's well, odd. if Shakespeare were around today, would he think Donald Trump was Richard III? I doubt it. Uh, I mean, we, we can uh, we live in a world of uh, of exaggerated uh, uh, accusations and distress. Uh, nonetheless, I think he would have recognized certain characteristics in the political life that we are now living: a certain kind of narcissism, a certain uh, indifference to apparent indifference to uh, the truth, uh, a reckless bullying. Uh, of others that, the, in any case, these were characteristics that he zeroed in on uh, when he tried to think of what kind of person does this. And then he also thought about 
who makes it possible for that person. Well, that's an interesting thing, a particularly interesting thing that you try to get at in the book, as did Shakespeare. Who were the enablers? Who were the people who allowed a Richard III or a Donald Trump to come to power? And then how do you resist, assuming you want to, or uh, somehow depose that power? Well, the first thing to say is that Shakespeare thought that it wasn't that large numbers of people were fooled. He thought actually most people got it, uh, that it isn't uh, that the wool was pulled over their eyes. They saw very clearly, uh, other than, than small children and a handful of idiots, uh, they saw very clearly that they were dealing with an untrustworthy person, with a liar, a congenital liar, uh, with a bully. But they, they were willing to either go along with or actively embrace these qualities because they saw for a variety of different reasons that Shakespeare is very... Uh, clever at teasing out, they thought that it was in their interest. And then the question is, what happens when, when it happens? And when it happens and they, you know, see the light, they realize they were wrong, how do they change? Well, Shakespeare doesn't think that they always see the light right away. On the contrary, I mean, there's a kind of high that, that uh, happens for a while. Uh, and then when things go wrong, it's often very difficult to change. But he's interested in who comes forward to say stop. Uh, he's interested in servants, civil servants as we might call them, but the, he wouldn't have called them that, but servants who, who say, I'm not going to go along with this. But there are small numbers and they usually suffer actually quite a lot before uh, the situation is resolved. And then Shakespeare thought about how this might be preventable, if it was preventable. So he thought about different options, mm -hmm. assassination for example, which That's he extreme. In an ex he, very extreme, and he thought about it hard, famously hard, in Julius Caesar, and he thought it was a terrible idea, uh, that it would hasten the very thing that, that uh, you were thinking through assassination you would avoid. And then, if that was the case, what else would be able to get you out? Well, some people speaking the truth, some people standing up, as a, a, a nameless servant does in King Lear, and say, saying, I'm not going along with this. I'm not going to allow you to do this. Uh, but that also is, doesn't work in a magical way. And then finally, at the end of his long career of thinking about this, Shakespeare returned to the idea of election, uh, again, oddly, and he thought political process, mm -hmm. that ordinary, unheroic, unglamorous political process by very ordinary politicians uh, my, who, who are determined to enable people to understand what is going on and what they can do about it, that that might be the way out. And so interesting that he thought of that then when it would have been a fairly radical idea. A, an astonishing idea. Yeah. Other parallels have been drawn. Uh, the Washington Post, in its review of the book, said uh, uh, Trump more like Caliban with a Twitter account than, <laughs> than Richard III. I laughed when I read this. I mean, I think that's underestimating... Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think if, uh, he's either like Caliban or the other example that they gave was the idiot Cloten in, in Cymbeline, but I don't think that that actually is, uh, corresponds to my sense of what's going on. So what does this mean when we look back hundreds of years and she, see Shakespeare plumb the depths of people like this, plumb their personalities and see these parallels, does it basically mean that human nature doesn't change? Well, it does mean that, that the world wasn't invented last night, Sam, that, that we're not alone, that these issues are not the first time that humans have confronted these issues, and other very intelligent people have thought about them. It doesn't provide a key that unlocks and solves the problem, but it, to me at least, and uh, I think to others, can be liberating to escape from the closed box of our own preoccupations and see that there's a, a, a that we we share the world with other people who've thought about uh, these matters deeply. As we said, you are a renowned Shakespeare uh, scholar. People clamor to take your course, but when you were first exposed to Shakespeare, you said it left you cold. So how did you kind of develop an affinity? Uh, was that being taught, or was that learning on your own? Well, it, certainly being taught. I mean, the first time that I was taught, I did have an uh, experience I didn't much enjoy. I was too young, probably, for it, or too naive to understand what was going on, and the teacher maybe wasn't so clever at, uh, at introducing recalcitrant 
uh, 14-year-olds to, to uh, uh, as you like it in this case. But I did have a brilliant teacher, and as most of us who uh, care about art do, somewhere have a brilliant teacher in high school and junior high school who actually gets it and gets who you are mm -hmm. and enables you. So important, it so is, vital. It's crucially important and enables you to accept your limitations and to bring also everything that you have in you to the table. And that remains for me now that I'm uh, very far away from my junior high school or high school experience remains for me critical here. You don't park yourself at the door, you take yourself with you. You bring your own interests, preoccupations, anxieties, knowledge such as it is, and also your ignorance. You bring it and you try to, to situate it in relation to the past. You're, you're, uh, you're, not, uh, you're not alone uh, and you can deal with the past because actually, even though we're talking about 400 years ago in the case of Shakespeare, uh, it actually is not so long ago. One of the things you've talked about is the fact that students today, as opposed to students when you began teaching, don't have the same kind of verbal acuity, but they do bring something else to the table, perhaps a visual acuity or something different. Is that better, worse, or simply different? I, I, from my perspective as a passionately literary person, as a word person, it's a little worse, uh, but I respect the the qualities that are also brewing in our culture, creative qualities, so that actually in, in certain ways, uh, television serials, and I never thought I would say this, uh, like The Wire or like Breaking Bad, seem to me genuinely Shakespearean uh, in their ability to develop a profound uh, relationship to characters and situations teased out over an epic length of uh, investigation. I think these are brilliant. Great. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Stephen Greenblatt. His latest book, Tyrant, Shakespeare on Politics, just been published by W.W. W. Norton and Company. And coming up next, New York Times theater photographer Sarah Krulwich. Welcome back. She's used to being behind the lens. Now she's being honored by the Broadway community for extraordinary achievement. One of three recipients of a special Tony Award on June 10th. As usual, Sarah Krulwich will also be covering it. Sarah, how did you become the Times' first culture photographer? I have to say that I, it, it's a roundabout answer. I had twins in 1992 and I, somebody had to stay home with them. And I could no longer, I had been a news photographer, so I had been jumping on airplanes and, car, and I covered campaigns and, and it just didn't work anymore. And I had really extraordinarily wonderful administrators of my department and they figured out that if I could be a culture photographer, I would be completely valuable to the paper and it worked for me as well. But to be a theater photographer, there was enormous resistance, as you point right. out, from the Broadway community. The they wanted their own pictures. Right. The theater did not happen right away. That took a couple of years. I, I, I started being the culture photographer, and I noticed that I was covering almost everything but theater. But the Times had such clout in the theater world. You know, it would be almost as if the Sports Illustrated decided to not cover sports in photos you know it was the one place that we were completely barred from entering it was fascinating you had a story uh, at nytimes.com and in the times explaining that theaters put out their own stock pictures and they had to be reviewed by virtually everyone involved in the play the actors wanted to make sure they looked just right and and everyone else had to sign off on these pictures so letting a stranger in who was going to take them impromptu was a really big step. Yeah, it's a, it still is. I mean, every single show is a little bit of a debate about whether I can get in, when can I get in, are the costumes right, are the, is the hair right, it, you know, am I going to give away the ending, you know. So every single time I am allowed into a show or a theater, uh, it's, you know, there's been a bargain and, you know, I feel really lucky that people now, I think I, I'm pretty much in every show this year, so that's a miracle. When do you shoot them, in previews or? <laughs> every single 
situation is different. Mostly what they try and do is the final dress rehearsal because it's much easier to shoot a show when you're close to the, get a three-dimensional feeling mm -hmm. when you're close to the stage. When you're at the back of the house, it's very flat. So if somebody's jumping, like in a dance or something, if you're close, it looks like they're 10 feet high. If you're in the back, you don't even know that they're off the ground. So it's better to be closer. So some producers would rather have me be there at the very beginning, like the final dress rehearsal where the other, the production photographer and I can sort of move around and be close up because those pictures are great and they have a lot of energy. But other producers want everything to be locked down. They mm. want the lighting to be right, the costume to be right. So they, don't, they let me in like the day before it opens, you know, so uh, that's in the back of the house and they don't care that it's flat. They know that the lighting is perfect and the costumes are perfect and they're happier with that. Do you ever chronicle the evolution of a show from just a, a basic reading all the way through to an opening night? I've done that only in, with an encore when they, because they only are up for two weeks. Mm -hmm. So it's possible to write a story and justify that kind of time spent. Because usually those early pictures are not that interesting to people. The finished product and the behind the scenes and the finished product is more interesting, I think. And when you're shooting a, a show, what do you look for? What, what makes a good theater photograph? For me, it's just emotion and energy. I really want to see something between the actors or some kind of feelings coming. And I think that's one of the reasons why a setup call where they just run like one scene, it's just never the same to me than somebody who's worked through the beginning, the middle, and they're getting to the, you know, climax of how they're feeling or they're crying or they're angry. You know, that to me is really uh, always what I'm looking for. Do you have any favorites, any favorite photographs, any favorite scenes that you were able to capture? Oh, yeah, of course. You know, and, and sometimes it's, you know, it's, we're only as good as the creatives. We're only as good as the people that are putting the stuff up there on, this, on the stage. So, mm. you know, I have favorite lighting designers because they make me look good. You know, I have favorite directors because they take chances and the stuff that's on the stage is just gorgeous, you know. So, you know, I look forward to being around these amazing people every time I step into a theater, but I have my favorites. Any I, favorites I this year? I would never say. <laughs> <laughs> I admire them all. Anyone who gets all the way to Broadway has got to be the top of, the, of a heap. You know, they're just amazing. And what do you shoot them with? I see you have a camera with you today. I have a camera. I'm doing what Bill Cunningham always did. I'm trying to document this week for me, or these weeks, because it's been such an amazing thing for me. So this is a Sony, it's a brand new camera, but it's silent, that's the, but I also use Canons, and I'll be shooting the Tonys, I think, with a Canon. And this is because it, in you know, having a camera that makes no noise is really a blessing for everybody in the theater. I mean, I think the clicking, even though it's so small, people, can tell whether you're taking the picture, if it's a very slow part of a play, and some actors on this side of the stage and some actors on that side of the stage, I don't want to take that picture. Sure. But I don't want them to feel bad either. So with a silent camera, when they haven't heard clicking ever, they aren't noticing that they don't I'm not, know they're <laughs> they don't know that I'm not taking and it. And of course, it doesn't need flash, and it is digital. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, and congratulations, Sarah Krulwich of the New York Times. You can see her photographs throughout the year in print and at nytimes.com. Coming up next, the backstory. Welcome back, and what kind of week has it been? One marked by violence in the Middle East, just miles away from where Americans celebrated the opening of an embassy in Jerusalem, and a cautionary tale for those using elevators at the Trump Tower. Someone's always watching. Joining me to discuss these stories and more, my Times colleagues, contributing writer Clyde Haberman and Eleanor Randolph. Eleanor, give us a quick handicap, if you will, on the race for attorney general. <laughs> That's hard. Well, you know, Tish James, the public advocate in, in the city of New York, she has declared, she's the one person who's actually come out and declared that she's running. 
She's not what she's not going to ask for the Working Families Party line, which is really interesting because the Working Families Party basically made her as a candidate when she ran for public advocate. But the governor doesn't want her to take it. And yes, that's right. She's been talking to the governor, and the governor says, you know, we're not. He's trying to destroy the Working Families Party. That's one of the things, you know. I mean, he doesn't. He he, he takes no prisoners, and so uh, he wants her to to. Next week, the Democratic Party is going to have their convention, and they can decide who goes on the ballot. They can give it to one person. They can give it to four people. Uh, and uh, there are other ways to get on the ballot, of course, but that's one of the easy ways to do it. Um, now, in the meantime, the legislature has interviewed all these people about the short-term job. and. Um, I think they've come around to to deciding that Barbara Underwood, who uh, is now the acting attorney general, should stay on, and then you just the politics they just fight it out. That probably makes the most sense. It does make the most sense. What about the mystery man in all this equation, and that's Preet Bharara? You know, nobody. I mean, he's been very. Um, He's kept his cards clo close to the vest, and there were rumors that he might run as an independent. There were rumors that the, uh, they're not rumors, the Republicans would really love to have him on, on their ballot line, and they have their convention next week as well. Um, I don't know, I might bet that he doesn't run. Wouldn't it make sense for Andrew Cuomo to push him through as the Democratic nominee? It would wipe away all of his previous ethics questions. I don't think that would ever happen. This is the guy. This is the guy who was basically investigating him, who put Shelley. Well, Silver. you can let bygones be bygones. <laughs> put Shelley Silver and Dean Skelos. You know, Shelley Silver at least uh, has been reconvic reconvicted. You know, the, the the attorney general is supposed to be totally independent of the governor and every other office in the state. So if Letitia James is not going to run on the working family, basically telling the working families party to go take a hike at the request of the governor, it does raise a question about her own independence, no matter how much she's going to, you know, champion that. Indeed. Uh, Clyde, this week uh, Tom Wolfe died, the great novelist and nonfiction writer as well. He was a champion, if you will, of the new journalism. I sort of thought the new journalism was the old journalism. Yeah, I, I never bought that term. You know, that's been around since the uh, mid to late 60s, and I never fully understood it. It seemed to be a lot of people, usually men uh, of that era, who uh, did an awful lot of legwork and an awful lot of re solid reporting and then wrote about it, maybe in a somewhat novelistic way, but there's no indication any of this was made up. The last time I look, a novel is nonfiction, right? Even if it's maybe based on real characters, as mo uh, many novels are. But uh, I, I thought it was a term that came up, you know, out of nowhere. It's sort of like Hunter Thompson's gonzo journalism that came up at the time. It's 50 years later. I still don't know what the hell that meant. Uh, so uh, journalism is journalism. Uh, you report it. You write it. If the facts are interesting and the writing is interesting, this is what we've been doing for a couple of hundred years. Well, That's right. That was Dickens true. and Mark Twain and... Right. Well, you know what I loved about uh, reading the obituary of... Uh, it was that... Every day he got up, he dressed in a three-piece mm -hmm. suit, he went down into the basement of his apartment, and he wrote uh, 10 pages. No triple matter what. Right, right. Triple space every single day. Just like Gay Talese does the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to Clyde Haberman and Eleanor Randolph for joining me, and I'll have some additional thoughts on CODA next. I once asked Bill de Blasio who, out of all the New Yorkers he knew, he found the most interesting. Without missing a beat, he chose Mary Sansone. For those of you who watch television, you know the Das Equis ad with the world's most interesting man, he said. Well, Mary Sansone, without question to me, was the most interesting person in New York City. She's a child of Italian immigrants who went on to become a social activist and fighter for civil rights, he said, and a lifetime of changing this world and changing this city for the better. Mary Sansone died this week. She would have been 102 years old next month. She stood only 4 foot 11, 
But she achieved a political stature that might have seemed anomalous for a Brooklynite who happened to be Italian-American, a woman, and a Democrat. In 1971, Bayard Rustin, the black civil rights leader, visited her home. That visit heralded an ambitious effort to unite the city's black, Hispanic, and white ethnic communities in a common agenda for political empowerment and improved municipal services. Mary de Blasio said, was working with people from different communities when it was almost taboo. I took part in every movement for justice, Mary told me, whether it was union rights, civil rights, human rights, women's rights, or gay rights. She was a Democrat, an early ally of Mario Cuomo, but she saw beyond political party to support Republicans like John Lindsay, Rudy Giuliani, and Mike Bloomberg. Mary, Mayor Bloomberg said, passionately believed that partisan politics should never get in the way of serving the public. Brooklyn Street Smarts was her barometer, what we used to call common sense. When Rudy Giuliani lost his first mayoral race, Mary Sansone threw him a party. Why, she asked, give a party to a person who wins? He's happy already. She dispensed grassroots wisdom that she had gleaned as an eight-year-old in Union Square, where her father addressed potential recruits to the industrial workers of the world. She criticized poor Italians for being too proud to apply for public assistance. She fought the mafia. She bluntly rebuffed critics who complained that her civic group had hired some of her relatives, saying, they were as qualified as anyone else, and being related was no reason to dismiss them. She was a Borough Park folk hero, a political godmother. I never yelled, I never screamed, and I always pretended I was a friend, Mary said. I told them off with a smile. For The New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.